Once again, good afternoon. Um, we're, gonna, we're going today uh, to uh, get an overview of uh, the history of the Ming Dynasty. But before I do that, I want to, as usual, do a review question with you. And uh, today's question deals with, uh, well, uh, last time I dealt with the decline of the Mughals. Uh, I believe that, um, in any case, uh, the next question deals with the same subject, so I'm not really going to deal with that. I'm going to move on to the question dealing with uh, the consequence, consequences of the English conquest of India. And I would say to begin with, uh, uh, they were um, dramatic. The consequences were dramatic. In the first place, uh, the English plundered, starting with Bengal, they plundered uh, India and uh, especially the gold, but uh, all sorts of other things. And some of the members of the company uh, became extremely rich as a result. Much of this gold found its way back to England and uh, recirculated through the banks. It helped us to finance the Industrial Revolution in England and also uh, the French Revolutionary Wars, which uh, of course England was uh, victorious. Um, furthermore, this um, uh, the English continued uh, uh, through the 19th century and into the 20th century to basically collect much of the tax revenue in India and actually, if one could believe it, uh, remit it, uh, send it to England. So uh, the English in this way directly benefited from uh, taxation imposed on the Indian population. And um, Therefore, the English enjoyed a, uh, into the 20th century, a very positive balance of payments relationship with India. And for that reason, uh, India was considered to be the, uh, the, uh, the diamond or the jewel of the empire. Now, um, a second consequence of the um, English conquest was the destruction of the cotton manufacturing industry, the most important industry in uh, India. Of course, it was hand manufacture and so on, but nevertheless, it, uh, Indian cotton had conquered all of Asia and um, Europe as well. And uh, the, of course, the British, through the Industrial Revolution, developed their own um, cotton industry and fixing the tariffs uh, they made it easy for Indian cottons to penetrate the Indian market, and they made it difficult for um, uh, Indian uh, cottons to um, uh, uh, reciprocate. Uh, and so you see a uh, precipitous decline in the Indian cotton industry during the 19th century with all of the consequences. The third element is that a third uh, consequence was uh, uh, India really, as I explained uh, earlier, really didn't have fully developed classes in the um, pre-British uh, or pre-English period. Uh, the uh, localized economy, the, um, the, bar the, uh, the barter relationship between craftsmen and um, and peasants in the villages um, uh, precluded the development of a market economy, development of uh, merchants, um, and the um, the people who exercise or, or who extracted tribute from the population were basically appointees of the state. Um, they were not an independent class. Well, with uh, the English conquest, the, um, the English introduced uh, private property. Uh, um, they legitimated the existence of landlords who from this point onwards became 
from the 19th century onward became um, the, uh, we could say, the dominant class in India. And they also brought an end to uh, the autarky of the villages. Remember how much I stressed uh, the fact that the villages were cut off in the market, had no relationship to the market. Well, this all came to an end. Um, so you have the development, first, first of all, of a landlord class. Another thing that uh, the uh, English brought was peace. That is to say, the wars between the different states uh, came to an end, and, um, and the whole of India was basically uh, united politically and economically by the English, um, who built the Indian National Railway, which in a way um, was absolutely fundamental in terms of uh, unifying the country uh, economically and politically, uh, laying the basis for the emergence of a, of a national market, as a matter of fact, over time. But uh, the English also brought peace. There was, of course, the famous um, uh, mutiny of 1857. That was really the only really major upheaval that marked the 19th century. And with peace came, um, and la landlordism, came the problem, the so-called problem of overpopulation, land shortage, <clears throat> and uh, the immiseration of most of the peasantry as a result. So it was a sort of two-sided thing. There was peace on the one hand, but overpopulation, immiseration of the peasantry uh, on the other. Um, a, uh, another uh, consequence um, of English rule was they did develop because they needed uh, um, a bureaucrats to run uh, the state administration, a modern education system in India. And I, I would say that in this respect, the English did a good job. Um, Indian education became uh, uh, very good in the course of the 19th century and uh, with the consequence that an educated middle class did arise in India. There was no economic development in India to speak of. The British basically sucked out all um, the surplus wealth there was and didn't permit um, the development of manufacturing to any extent that would compete with the English man uh, manufacturer. But on the other hand, they did create this middle class and this middle class, this educated middle class played a big role eventually in the development of the Indian independence movement. And eventually it did create, uh, despite the best efforts of the English, um, an economic middle class as well. So the consequences of English, they, they uh, immiserated India at the same time for the first time, I would say they gave Indian history a kind of dynamic based on class, is what I would conclude. Are there any questions about uh, this particular answer uh, that may uh, you may have? Okay, very good. So we'll move on now to the narrative of um, the history of Ming China. I think one of the things we should uh, point out that uh, uh, I'm dealing with uh, the, for, the period from the 14th to the 17th century uh, in the first instance in terms of dealing with the Ming, but we've already seen that the Ming dynasty is uh, just part of a cycle of successive dynasties that date back uh, to the Han dynasty or even earlier. So there's a whole series of these. And many of the reasons for the rise and fall of these dynasties are similar to what happened under the Ming. There are certainly new elements, particularly the growing relationship between China and uh, uh, the global economy is a new factor. But uh, many of the other factors that characterize the Ming dynasty also characterized the rise and fall of the earlier dynasties. So we saw that this um, 
peasant boy, um, this peasant boy, Zhu Wang Zhang, uh, he was the one who liberated China from the Yuan Dynasty. Um, and uh, he set up the capital, first of all, in Nanjing. It was ultimately moved to Beijing in the north uh, because of the uh, threat from um, invasion uh, by the Mongols. Uh, uh, but um, in the first instance, the capital was established here in Nanjing. And if you go to Nanjing, as I have, uh, you see this uh, the fantastic, the city walls of Nanjing uh, are dwarf anything you see in Europe. It's, uh, it's unbelievable, this, this scale of uh, these uh, defensive ramparts. It gives you a sense of uh, the incredible uh, mobilization of labor that was possible in um, early modern China. Now, this emperor was a, was a great reformer. This, uh, his, uh, uh, his reign, he made it clear from all of his proclamations and edicts, was meant to basically reconstruct uh, and restore um, the uh, Han rule over China, the, the major ethnic group. Uh, they had expelled uh, the, uh, the Mongols, and this was going to be a Han restoration. And it involved agrarian reform, it obviously involved um, the reunification of the country, and it also um, entailed um, the restoration of uh, Confucianism, the, uh, the uh, Confucian um, ideology, um, uh, not only was it uh, uh, reestablished as the basis of the state, but it was reinforced. Um, conformity to Confucian uh, ideology was um, rigorously imposed uh, on intellectual and cultural life uh, by Zhu Wanzhang and all of his successors under the Ming. Now, uh, an important aspect of this reform, probably the most important, was the land reform. Because as I, as I explained, um, ordinarily the peasants um, had or owned uh, something like 30% of the land. Well, um, by the time uh, the, the Ming took power, uh, their amount, the, the, the landlords had basically confiscated most of the land and uh, Zhu Wanzhang in a great land reform gave 50% of the land to back to the peasants, uh, taking it away from the landlords and to their horror. Um, uh, secondly, he made sure that um, in the, of course the, uh, he had reimposed the Confucianism and the, ma and the examination system but he made sure that 50% of those who became mandarins through the examination system were peasant boys, not the sons of landlords, but the son of the peasants um, were given a, a greater place. Um, and uh, third element I explain is the army, which had grown to, to be of an enormous scale was told to, to basically grow its own food so as not to impose itself on the population. They were self-supporting. In this respect, uh, this of course echoes what later happened under Mao Zedong where the Red Army also uh, was required to basically um, grow its own food uh, and not impose itself on the population. Um, the whole infrastructure of China was restored canals, roads, granaries, uh, the signaling system that the government used to pass information, all of this was restored um, and improved uh, under the first of the Ming emperors. Um, one further aspect was the decentralization of government. Um, local government was revived and given many responsibilities, 
uh, so as to reduce the, la the um, imposition of the uh, state bureaucracy, the central state bureaucracy. And finally, uh, all sorts of penalties, laws uh, against corruption and bureaucratic factionalism were imposed. So this is a, um, a thoroughgoing reform, uh, revitalization. Now, um, uh, another um, aspect um, uh, of this restoration was the restoration of what was considered to be the, the proper relationship between China and the outside world. Now they had pushed the Mongols out. And in fact, under the Ming, the Great Wall, which had already be begun to be built way back during the Han Dynasty, if you can believe it. Again, this incredible and ongoing public works. Uh, it was now, um, um, uh, the building the Great Wall was was um, uh, restarted by the Ming and the Great Wall was greatly extended over hundreds and hundreds of miles under the uh, Ming dynasty to keep out the, um, the, the invaders from the steppe. But beyond that, uh, well, one has to, in order to understand Chinese foreign policy, you have to understand the way the Chinese elite regarded themselves. And they, uh, their view of the world was marked by a very strong ethnocentrism. That is to say, the belief in Chinese superiority and Han superiority was fundamental to the outlook. Now, I mentioned ethnocentrism at the beginning of this course, and I noted that uh, virtually every ethnic group in some way or another considers itself to be superior. Of course, it's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, the Chinese version is no less ridiculous than all the rest. But in the Chinese case, um, in part, one can sort of understand it in two senses. First of all, if you look at the surrounding countries, and these are the countries in which China was in contact, that is to say, Thailand or Korea or Japan um, or Vietnam or Korea, uh, um, the, all of these uh, other countries, basically their cultures had developed as offshoots of Chinese culture, um, variants of, uh, of Chinese culture. And furthermore, in an economic and political sense, China dwarfed all these other countries. And so the other people that China knew around it, were uh, culturally and politically, they were in a sense dependencies of China. So the notion of China as the big brother, if you like, um, was uh, deeply rooted in the Chinese mentality. Furthermore, from an economic point of view, China was uh, essentially self-sufficient. And it really, uh, I mean, trade with other countries might have some use, but for the most part, China produced everything it needed. And um, other countries came to China for the, particularly the luxury goods, the pottery, the silk, um, et cetera. And so the Chinese, from an economic point of view, they didn't need these other countries. So the sense of superiority was deeply uh, rooted. And so it expressed itself in terms of foreign policy and the idea of the, the, the tribute system. Uh, that is to say, China rejected the idea that uh, of equality between, uh, in relationships between different states. In Europe, as I've tried to explain, really from the time of Machiavelli onwards, there were these dipl diplomatic relations between the different European states and ambassadors were on an equal footing. Uh, of course, some countries were stronger than others. A place like France obviously was stronger than Savoy or Florence, but 
formally at least, there was a, a kind of a, a legal equality between these ambassadors. Well, that's not the way the Chinese conducted their foreign relations. Uh, they adhered to the tribute system. That is to say, their view was, if we're going to have any relations uh, with Korea or Vietnam or Thailand, we're doing you a favor. We're doing you a favor. And so if you're going to have a relationship with us, you must recognize that you are a tributary of China. You are dependent or a satellite of China. Uh, this is known as the tributary system. And you must bow down or kowtow. Um, you must kowtow to us. You, you must recognize our superiority. And that was the, uh, uh, the basic policy. Um, on the other hand, I would say that um, although um, uh, clearly this represents a kind of ethnocentrism, the Chinese, uh, for the most part, adopted a hands-off policy toward their neighbors. They didn't interfere that much. I'm not saying they didn't interfere. As you'll see later, they did it. Uh, we, we do see uh, Chinese, uh, some Chinese attempts to regulate things in Vietnam and Korea and so on. But for the most part, uh, they avoided war with their neighbors. And the history of China is much less marked by war. The history of Europe is marked by a continuous war from uh, continuing from the Middle Ages right down to the French Revolution, just a series of wars. Well, that's not true of uh, China. Its relationships with its neighbor were mainly peaceful, one would say. Now, another feature, and this, in many ways it helps us to penetrate into the dynamics of the Chinese um, state and economy. One of the features of Chinese history that is much marked, has been much marked in recent times is the fact that in the 15th century, China, the Chinese state organized a series of great fleets. China had uh, uh, naval vessels, we call them junks, the Chinese junks, um, which were comparable to the caracks, the caravels, the galleons of early modern Europe. The Chinese junk with its sails, with its rudder, with its uh, um, rounded bottom, um, uh, carrying a lot of freight, uh, was comparable. I wouldn't say, I think that the European naval technology was superior. That's, that's my view. It could cut through the water and at speeds that were uh, already from the 16th century superior to those in China, but nevertheless, the Chinese um, vessels were impressive and the Chinese state Im imposed or sorry, uh, organized <clears throat> um, huge fleets of these junks who in the, in the first part of the and middle part of the 15th century visited and traded with the whole of Asia across the Pacific and into the Indian Ocean all of the main um, uh, trading centers were visited by these trading expeditions. Um, and this became a kind of a policy in the 15th century until it was discontinued uh, in, the uh, in the later 15th century. Well, some scholars, when they learned of these things said, well, the Chinese had explored the Pacific and the uh, Indian Ocean before the Portuguese and the Spaniards ever got going. So the Chinese were ahead. Uh, but in recent times, this view of things has been discounted because what scholars say now is that um, the European voyages were private enterprises, whereas the Chinese voyages, these fleets were largely government sponsored. Um, as a matter of fact, Chinese merchants were already 
trading all over the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. The state basically was trying to control this trade. The, the, the whole conception was completely different. Uh, the Chinese merchants were all over the uh, Asia. Um, the organization of these, uh, these uh, fleets, trading fleets by the Chinese government was an attempt to bring these merchants under the control of the Chinese state which is uh, uh, very different from the European thing because the Europeans, uh, basically these uh, sailing venturers, although they were commissioned or licensed by the Spanish and the Portuguese, were private enterprises. These were private enterprises. We saw like the case of Columbus, it was Italian bankers who were the main backers of these things. But in the case of China, it was political and uh, what I would conclude from that is that um, this idea that merchants have to be controlled is absolutely central to the Chinese, the thinking of the Chinese political elite, and has to be borne in mind. I'll come back to it a bit later. Furthermore, another aspect of this we should note is that China had everything it needed. On the contrary, the Europeans wanted the luxury goods of Asia, they wanted the spices of Asia. Um, uh, their, uh, their, uh, the European voyages were based on um, uh, a demand for foreign goods. Um, this was not, not true of China. China was not, had no appetite for um, foreign goods, but what drove the Europeans was access to the silks, porcelains, the spices that were available in Asia. And furthermore, uh, because uh, everybody came to China to get the luxury goods, China enjoyed a balance of payments surplus constantly. In fact, it grew and grew right through the 16th century. Um, silver pouring into China as merchants from Europe and elsewhere uh, basically um, uh, brought in silver in order to buy the porcelains, the silks, and so on. Um, in the case of the Europeans, the Europeans were faced with a constant balance of payments deficit. So the uh, relationship, uh, the uh, whole basis of, of, in terms of global trade uh, as between the Europeans and the Chinese was completely different. Now, Another feature of the Ming state that has to be stressed and uh, is quite important in terms of the, uh, the outcome is uh, the fact that um, Zhu Wanzhang, the first the Mongol, uh, sorry, um, Ming emperor uh, restored Confucianism in China and in fact enforced a very strict ideological control which continued um, um, right through the Ming period, uh, you, uh, you, you could not, uh, it was uh, impossible virtually to introduce another mode of thought uh, It was regarded as politically subversive to do so. Um, and um, uh, the, um, uh, this um, um, ideological orthodoxy which I, I would say has a lot to do with the, uh, the, fa the, the attitudes of the Mandarin class and of the landlords, their conservatism, especially their conservatism faced with the internal changes that were happening at a social and economic level within Chinese society. The reaction of the state and the state elites was extremely conservative, clinging on to Confucianism enforcing Confucianism um, in a conservative manner. Um, well, uh, this was problematic because well, as we'll see um, during the Ming period from the 14th to the 16th century, population grew rapidly and uh, there was a considerable economic progress as we'll also see. Um, but the, um, the dominant ideology remained uh, this uh, conservative metaphysical and ethical philosophy. 
And as a result of that, there was little in the way of scientific or technological innovation or generally innova uh, positive innovation generally in, uh, uh, under the Ming uh, dynasty. And this contradiction between rising population, rapid social and economic change, and this conservative attitude on the part of the state um, ultimately is what undermined the, the Ming dynasty. Now, in terms, I want to elaborate a little bit on the nature of this, um, this uh, Confucian ideology. I, I have uh, stressed that um, uh, conformity to this was considered uh, a, uh, not merely a, a, um, a sort of an ideological matter, but it was a political matter. If you got out of line, um, you were politically suspect. Well, the result uh, was that intellectual life under the Ming tend to, tended to be uh, that you needed to be more Confucius that Confucian than Confucius himself. Uh, that is to say, the intellectuals, given these constraints, they uh, stressed their orthodoxy, stressed the degree to which theirs was the true interpretation of Confucius. And so what you have basically is a series of uh, uh, Confucian movements amongst the mandarins. It, we're, all, we're talking about now the intellectual life of the mandarin. And it is characterized by this uh, incredible um, uh, orthodoxy and con um, contention on the part of those who followed these uh, leaders of these uh, neo-Confucian movements, that theirs was the true interpretation of, of, of Confucian. The first of these uh, Confucian movements was originated by uh, this uh, intellectual, uh, Wang Yang Ming. See, he dies in the opening years of the 16th century. Well, his followers, convinced of their rectitude, um, they founded new schools outside the state schools in order to develop their particular interpretation of the Confucian ideology. And lo and behold, we find that um, they're very successful. This, uh, the followers of uh, Wang Yang Ming um, in terms of the state examinations. Uh, more and more of the mandarins are recruited from this element. And the state ultimately sees this as a political threat. So in 1579, uh, this whole movement is suppressed uh, by the state. And then the, the same thing happens with respect to a new version of Confucianism, which um, uh, develops in opposition to the movement of uh, Wang Yang Ming. The Donglin Academy, this is an academy located near Beijing, uh, develops a, a new interpretation that is even uh, uh, claims to be even more uh, a purer form of, of um, Confucianism than um, anything else. And it too founds, um, uh, find success on the examination. Well, once again, um, you see the state intervening and in a series of bloody purges between 1624 and 1627, um, the, the movement of the Donglin Academy is suppressed. Uh, finally, um, toward the end of the main period, that is to say, in the opening years of the 17th century, um, a, a final movement of Neo-Confucianism develops uh, uh, in many places in China. And uh, in the first instance, it's devoted to studying literature from the Confucian point of view, but it, it quickly is perceived as a threat and uh, is once again crushed by the state. 
Um, what I'm really talking about here is, is like factions and sects, intellectual sects, generally very conservative. Well, they're all conservative uh, and uh, very suspicious of um, um, anything outside of the Confucian uh, canon, the Confucian dogmas. And an interesting um, example of this intolerance is uh, the fact that um, Catholicism was introduced into China, the Chinese court, in the late 16th century by the Jesuits. Remember, I explained the importance of Jes Jesuit missions, all uh, Latin America, but also very much in Asia. Well, they arrived at the Chinese court, the Jesuits, in the 1580s, and they were welcomed, particularly because they brought scientific instruments, clocks, all sorts of new forms of measurement. A telescope uh, was brought into China by the Jesuits during this period. Well, um, along with the suppression of the Donglin Academy, uh, the Jesuits were ousted uh, by the Chinese court uh, during the 1620s. The Jesuits were expelled as well. Although one should note that uh, the Chinese state was unable to eliminate Catholicism. And Catholicism, Christianity, if you like, uh, remained a presence, to be sure, a minority presence in China from this point onwards. Well, in any case, I said that uh, the character of Chinese intellectual life was extremely conservative, and I, I attribute this to the dominance of the, uh, uh, certainly the landlords, uh, the Mandarin class, um, also a factor that uh, a lot of people talk about is that um, there was this constant threat from the Mongols and uh, uh, the preoccupation with the northern guarding the, uh, the northern frontier from Beijing and uh, it induced a very conservative attitude. Um, the south of China where there were many merchants tended to be more open, more liberal, more, we can say more intellectually and socially uh, liberal, if we can use that kind of, that mode of expression. The North tended to be much more conservative. But the, uh, the thing is that given the fact that the Chinese population rose dramatically under the Ming, and that there was so much in the way of economic uh, growth that these conservative attitudes on the part of the court, on the part of the mandarins, uh, made it uh, very difficult to respond in a positive way uh, to these changes. You will note that uh, I said that in Europe uh, at the end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th century, mercantilism state intervention into the economy, supporting the growth of the economy, uh, became uh, uh, common policy amongst the major European state. Well, the Chinese state uh, were not interested in this. And um, uh, it, it's at this point, the late 16th, uh, 17th century, that really China loses its technological and scientific advantage vis-a-vis -vis the West. Now, first of all, um, uh, the uh, population growth. At the time that the Ming came to power, China had about 85 million people. Um, uh, in 1650, at the end of the Ming period, that's 300 years, China's population had grown to 268 million. So um, almost tripling, you could say, the Chinese population almost tripled uh, during this period. And that China um, at that point, that is to say um, in 1650 with its 268 million people had one third of the world's population. 
So this whole question of overpopulation in China uh, became real at this point. Well, as a result of this uh, gr rapid growth of population, there were uh, land shortages. The peasants didn't have enough land. And uh, uh, this becomes a factor in, uh, in the absence of a sort of uh, improvements in agricultural productivity. Um, this uh, becomes a serious contradiction and it's one of the reasons for the uh, overthrow of the, uh, of the Ming dynasty. On the other hand, having said that, this is, the, this is the basic structural problem in terms of uh, uh, the outcome for the Ming. Nevertheless, the market economy grew prod prodigiously. Uh, for one thing, China, well, they had the, the great rivers, the yellow, but especially the Yangtze River, which is still uh, such an important artery. But along the Yangtze River, there were vast numbers of canals. The state had built uh, canals uh, connecting the Yellow and the, and the Yangtze River. Um, and there was a whole web of canals. And as well, roads and highways, bridges, uh, all um, uh, developed um, under the Ming. Um, and uh, the cities um, became, uh, the, there were many large cities. Beijing uh, had over a million people, and there were many other cities which were almost as big uh, during the, uh, the uh, Ming period. On the other hand, it is notable, like uh, the Ottomans in this respect, that um, the state did not permit the cities to have an independent municipal government. Whereas in Europe, it was pretty commonplace that uh, cities had uh, legal charters, privileges, and so on, and the right to uh, some degree of self-government, this didn't exist. Uh, the state was uh, very suspicious of merchants. Along the Yangtze River, which as I said, was the main access of economic life, um, a vast textile industry grew up. Cotton, as in India, but also uh, silk production on a vast scale. Silk production, which really goes back to the Middle Ages, now under the uh, Ming becomes uh, an enormous industry, mainly along the Yangtze. And it's not only the production of raw silk and cotton, but also, of course, textile manufacture and export. Silk is, along with porcelain, are the main Chinese exports and are in demand all over Asia and in, of course, in Europe as well. Another uh, uh, center of industry is um, the growing of tobacco and sugar, the growing and processing of sugar and tobacco. This all comes, of course, from the new world, the sugar and tobacco. Well, in the very south of China, but also in the Yangtze Valley, um, the production of tobacco, the Chinese became great smokers and um, uh, smoking is still a problem in China. Um, tobacco and sugarcane production um, uh, became very important. Um, the, um, another um, more widespread beyond the, the southern province of China or the Yangtze was uh, the production of new crops uh, like sweet potatoes and peanuts, again, from the New World, from Latin America, basically, same as sugar and tobacco. Um, now, these were important because uh, sweet potatoes and peanuts have um, high caloric content and help to support the, the Chinese population. Uh, of course, the Chinese population basically depended on um, either rice or in the north, wheat, but these crops supplemented the uh, diet. Now, a last area of major economic development that has to be me uh, mentioned are the potteries. The production of porcelain was, uh, it, it was centered in the northwestern part of China, 
And um, again, a world market, these, these porcelains, uh, which are exquisitely beautiful, um, were in great demand all over the world, and especially in Europe. The Europeans only learned to produce uh, porcelain in the 18th century, in the, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, European porcelain is invented. But um, until then, uh, Chinese porcelain was um, a very important export. So to repeat, it's uh, silk and porcelain, which are the most important exports. Later on, we can anticipate, of course, um, in the late 17th century from then on, tea becomes also a huge uh, crop, vast consumption in China, but also export, export to Europe, especially, of course, the English become fixated on tea. Um, so um, uh, this gives you a sense of some of the elements of uh, dynamism in the Chinese society, in Chinese economy. Uh, as a result of this dynamism, thousands of small market towns appeared in China, new towns, signifying the growth of an urban population that doesn't live directly from agriculture, but is living off trade and manufacture. Many, many small towns, just as in Western Europe, the same thing is true in Western Europe, uh, so in China. So the question arises, was China on the verge of a capitalist breakthrough? Could capitalism, the scholars have asked that question, in these last years, could China have become a capitalist country? Well, it certainly had private property as a, they knew the concept of private property. There was a lot of wage labor in China, certainly in the industries I've mentioned. Um, wage labor was a common form of production in, in China. So the combination of property rights and wage labor suggests uh, that, um, capitalism could have uh, developed. On the other hand, remember the mandarins, remember the landlords, remember Confucianism. All of these stood resolutely opposed to the merchants. As a matter of fact, based on the direct teachings of Confucius, Confucius uh, conceived of a proper social hierarchy. For him, the gentry or the landlords were rightfully the elite of society. Next came the peasants who produced the food. Then came the craftsmen. Well, where were the merchants? The merchants were at the bottom of society. Why is that? Because the merchants were regarded as unruly, subversive, dangerous, corrupt. Uh, there was this deep, uh, uh, fear of the merchants, antagonism between, basically this comes to hostility between uh, landlord agrarianism and the merchant class. It's a class conflict. Um, and so of course there had to be merchants, but they needed to be closely controlled. Um, we see this uh, the, in the Ottoman state, the merchants were also controlled larger by the fact that they were of uh, inferior uh, religion um, or ethnic group. And in the Mughal state, the merchants had a certain presence in, mer in, in Muslim society, but uh, uh, merchants and markets did not penetrate down to the villages. In China, they became extremely important in the Ming period, but um, they were uh, suspected and suppressed by the Chinese state. We'll pick up this uh, in the next class.